unmuted the right. Oh, there we go. Hi, this is Cindy. And Michael. And I believe our sound is on now. So if you can confirm on that, that would be great. Hello to Finite World. Thanks for checking in and helping us out. Um, and we are, we have a few things to go over. I hope everybody had a good 4th of July. Um, I have a few people in the room so far and I was just playing with that slideshow. So um, you can let me know your input on that uh, as we wrap things up to get started to have something like that going. Um, so it gives you a little hint of what's coming for I the wish show. I wish some elevator music that's like all crackly and doesn't have a good connection. There is some music. There is elevator. music, but it's our theme music. Oh, it's not, so it's not elevator music. Not it's unsolicited call music? No, it's it's our theme music. So, um, and I know there's a bit of, a little bit of a delay as I was watching the slideshow go through. So, um, I guess we should get a confirmation that this mic is working, but it looks I'm working. Like it is. You're working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that mic is working or the sound mic is working? I've been working. working most of the day. You have been working most of the day. <laughs> there are so many mics around here. My permaculture instructor is a mic. And when he came for the site visit, I kept saying, like, I kept speaking to both of them and just saying mic and of like both reacts. I'm like, I mean, my mic or permaculture mic. <laughs> but, um... But, uh, and then of course there's a mic from the Pat family and we have the same issue there and we're getting close to the Hootenanny. Mm -hmm. So just a few weeks away. We're what, three weeks out. Um, yeah, it's on the 28th. So if any of you guys are interested, I think there's uh last I heard on Thursday, there are a couple of campsites left. If you want to okay. grab those up. Yeah. The, I mean, there's, I think someone dropped out. So that mm -hmm. opened up. Um, and I believe that's just two down from the Pratt. And then if it hasn't closed, if it hasn't filled up again. Um, and I think they said there was one or two more in that section of the campground. And then um, a couple across the campground that were available. So you guys should check out the Pratt's and the... We need to get our camping stuff out. And... Yeah, we got to test our tent out because we don't have... We, we go rustic. We go with tents. Um, hi, Bree. How are you? Um, so yeah, we do have to test our tent and maybe get some waterproofing stuff for that because we haven't used it in like 10 years. I don't think I've ever used that tent. Didn't we use it in Rhode Island? Oh, we did. Yeah. And then you I used did it a couple Laura. of times with your sister. Yeah. Yeah, we did. I used it once in Maine and once in Pennsylvania. In yeah, the I don't think, no, I think we used it not even, we didn't go that far with no, it. No, we just went to Rhode Island in Connecticut. Um, oh, did we? I did. I was seeing that one time. Yeah. No. That was back when sometimes we'd have a holiday and I'd get a delayed two day, <laughs> but that quickly disappeared because I'd have to be, even though we technically had two days off, I'd have to get back to work to get things set for whatever was happening the next day. So uh, the union crew would get two days off and I'd have to come in on salary and go do most of a day. Yeah. So that disappeared after a year or two. Yeah. Well, and then I got deferred, and then I just worked through the holidays. We get deferred holidays, but we weren't. We we're supposed to take them as fast as possible, but like being in holiday. season, we would end up taking them in January. Yeah, we just string them together. It was just silly. And we weren't going tent camping in the no. north in January, no. although we did go hiking in Trinidad um, in uh, January, and some of that include or February, and some of that included some uh, some overnight stuff, but not with our tents. But, um, so. We must be on vacation or something. She's having, Well, fabulous. Maybe. It seems like a lot of people took a lot of vacation part of weeks yeah. or whole weeks. We really had a normal week. Hey, Valerie. We were pretty, pretty busy doing yeah. stuff. Um, I had Wednesday off, but, but we didn't have anything really planned at all. Well, you sat in front of the computer all day. and I was did. making videos. <laughs> and so I went downstairs and worked on my kitchen most of the day. Yeah. I'm under deadlines for you have inspection. production somewhat. And then I have a big inspection. I'm my biggest inspection on Wednesday. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, so. I'm scrambling to, well, we're in good shape, but I'm scrambling to finish that up and uh, keep it on track. Yep. So we do have, you do have a lot to do, 
but I mean, there were a couple things that happened on the 4th of July that weren't planned. Um, no, never on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, on the 4th of July, well, one thing I'll get to the, our biggest excitement on the 4th. Um, but we had, we were moving our chickens in the evening on the 4th. Yeah, that was exciting. That was Cindy's idea. My idea was the third. Well, I, I wanted to start doing it on Wednesdays in general. Um, so it just happened to play a role in there because I get off work a little earlier on Wednesdays. So we have more time to do things in the evening. Um, but I also go to work earlier, so I'm usually tired. But anyway, so we're moving the chickens. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. I think I'm Your still smelling. Allergies. My allergies went crazy yesterday all of a sudden in the afternoon. But I think the bug spray bothers me too a little bit. Uh Oh, I don't have any on anymore. I put a little bit on. Did you put the deed on or did you? I just no, mixed up No, I put some. on the, I put on the, the citronella. The spray, the yeah. commercial spray stuff that's not working. The, the herbal one. Yeah. Yeah. But you mixed up new stuff? I did mix up oh, new stuff God. just this afternoon. So, um, but it, I, I'm trying to find a, a mix of essential oils that works well for mosquitoes. <laughs> He's been having allergies the last two days. Um, and it works well. The stuff I have works well for ticks, but not really for mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes are insane this year. It's crazy. Um, anyway, so as he comes back, <clears throat> tell our little story that we didn't get on video at all. But I'll give you a little story on, on this. So as we were moving our chickens on Wednesday, we had them opened up for the fence. We had just moved the coop, and the fence was three quarters of the way around and we're hoping the chickens and uh, Lucky would move and go up because it was the end of the night so they usually we do this at the end of the night so that they can just go up into the coop um, and they're not free ranging uh, without protection very long but as we're doing this somebody decided to enter the yard from the woods um, this cute puppy just kind of showed up no collar and right through our neighbor's field yeah there was a little forest line between the field and our back of our field yeah. areas and all of a sudden that we both looked up and, and there there's a puppy dog standing there not a puppy adult dog um and he just kind of showed up and happy luckily kind of came over and and mike was across halfway across the yard from me and i was like uh mike there's a dog here and we have the chickens loose um, I thought the dog was going to look for a moment and then take off, but it never did. No, it wasn't interested in the chickens at all. Completely ignored the chickens that were like, I don't know, 20 feet away, maybe. And I got myself between the dog and the chickens just in case. But um, he was just, you know, happy, panting, smiling, very pretty, very relaxed. And came over and leaned on me and and then laid down and rolled over and asked for belly rubs and we got him some we got some water we didn't you know of course it was at this point about ten o'clock at night fireworks approaching were going ten o'clock yeah it was almost dark yeah and so we weren't sure if the dog had been spooked from all the fireworks that were right. happening uh, we didn't recognize it no sure. I had no idea who this dog belonged but to it clearly belonged to somebody because great farm dog yes I it agree was very. Uh, it was very calm and very well behaved. So we're like, this is not a stray. This no, is... and overfed. It was yeah, a little... <laughs> it, was, it was a little heavy. <laughs> yes, he's a pretty, pretty boy. Well, we, yeah, we got him water. You got a leash because we had the leashes from our last dogs. And we brought him in and just closed him in our bedroom. So, because we had to get the chickens in. And I was still a little concerned. Although he seemed to follow me when I called him and um he hung right by you yeah he, he you was stayed right old. at my side i was like he's an older dog yeah uh, because it was very he looked like a herding dog of sorts and yeah he was very calm for a herding dog so Extreme. it's like he is not a two or three year old dog no he was the older dog and high green gables and christy butts but anyway so we put him in the bedroom and he watched through our window for a little bit but then we got the chickens wrapped up come inside He's hanging out in our closet, so I'm thinking he might be a little bit nervous of the fireworks, but not really showing it much. Um, just hanging out in there, and so, you know, got him water, and we went to drive around to see if there was anybody looking for him. We drove up and down our large, our large block and a half, 
in the backside like twice, but people were just starting to leave from fireworks because now yeah. it was like 11, almost 11.30. Yeah, I was getting late. And there was a little bit of activity, but there was no obvious things going on or people. Nobody obviously looking. Out, so. Yeah. Um, and then, so we, you know, in the morning, I'm like, what are we going to do with this dog? He completely ignored the cat too, by the way. Walked right by yep. the cat. cat no problem. And we're like, oh my gosh, it's cat so amazing. So we just, pe- he slept. In our bedroom, we did. We next to you, it. he slept right down next <laughs> the to the floor. bed. Yeah. Um. Totally calm. We got him. You know, we got him a little, little snack, and then we got him breakfast yeah. in the morning. And yeah, we didn't have any dog food on hand, so we just did some pulled chicken and rice, and um, and then I went and took him for a walk, and walked towards the direction where he was coming, but down our road, um. And just to try to see if I could find, you know, someone looking for them and th- things. I thought so, too. It looks like a Border Collie, and that's what we my guess like, was. We were like, it's a herding dog. Is it a collie? I was like, no, I know it's heavy, but it's it's paws and bone was were too looked big. big. yeah. Its tongue was big. In fact, it looked like our St. Bernard, just a third Like smaller. a cross. Yeah. Like a cross between a St. Bernard and a Border and Collie. And a Swissie or yeah. something uh, because it was had a big bone structure. And it has a dock ta- dock tail as well. Cindy did some research and figured out exactly what it was. I actually looked up and I was like, I think it might be an Australian Shepherd because their coloration can vary quite a bit and often and have dock tails. And, and they're dark, yeah, yeah, it was totally an Australian Shepherd. But uh, so we went and, you know, still didn't find the owner when I took him for a walk in the morning. I ran into a neighbor who was walking her dog and said, you know, asked her and she had no idea who it belonged to, but she was just headed out for her walk. So, um, came back, I was like, Mike was going to take him to the vet and see if he had the micro I was trying to go to the vet, go to our vet, yeah, and so, well, I tried to feel for a chip, because they're usually yeah. between the shoulder blades, but you can't always feel them. Like, well, the best bet is to go check the vet, because yeah. we didn't really want to call the police, either on 4th of July, we have a very small police precinct, it's yeah. mostly state and county, and then our neighbor, and then our village, which is right next to us, has like two... Um, they have more than two cops, but two it's just, or three. So yeah, yeah. so I, I didn't really want to call them because I'm sure they were busy. And then and we also them. and they usually either take them or give them a ticket. And we're like, well, we'll hang on to them for a day or two yeah. um, if we can find the owner, just to just to was, prevent all the confusion and ticketing and fines. Yeah. So I was to the point where I'm like, oh, there was no collar at all. No, no collar. Other thing that yeah. So we had no idea who we're, it was. Yeah, and I was to the point where this dog is so friendly and so well trained. Um. That she I was like, to if, kidnap it. I was gonna say, if we can't find the owner, I want this dog. Um, I'll keep it, you know, because it was a very nice dog. Very sweet, very good with the animals, and um, so as I was leaving for work on Thursday morning, someone ha- started riding the bike up our driveway, and so I stopped and talked to him a little bit, and he said, a neighbor pointed out, said that our next door neighbor, actually, yeah. yeah. We thought I thought it was the woman who was walking her dog, but I guess it was the next door neighbor. Because we had it texted out. like the two, yeah. three people in the area that we knew that night. We knew they all have dogs and stuff, but we knew we said we knew it wasn't their dogs. Yeah. But if but in we're case like, they well, knew. we'll just try and see if anybody yeah. stopped by, because yeah. otherwise we'd know anybody in the area. Though. So we just were telling everybody we could figure out. You know, we have this dog. You know, please help us find the owner. And he just started riding his bike up the driveway that Thursday morning, and. Um, we able to figure it out. It was his. And apparently um, they were supposed to leave on vacation. You know, they were going to drive out at five o'clock in the morning, but they had been looking for their dog basically all night. He said he hardly slept because they just put the dog's brother down a week ago, which actually our friend Kelly, she mentioned that it's, it's, since he wasn't really reacting to the fireworks, he was mm-hmm. probably looking for his brother. Probably. That would yeah. make sense. So... Yeah, and he confirmed that he's an Australian Shepherd, and um, they were just they had delayed their their leaving for vacation to hopefully find him because they were worried because they had just you know lost the other dog. But and he says this dog really never gets out. It always has a collar on. I don't know if they had people over, but due to everything going on with the yeah. holiday, just one of those circumstances where yeah. um, yeah. just got out and went for a walk, and he's probably. I think I know which neighborhood he's in. Um, there's a cu- only a couple around yeah. here, uh, but I, I think, I think he's on, on our road. I don't think it's around the corner. There's one on yeah, the road. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. there's one too. Um, but uh, that's probably like about a mile, maybe. You know, not that far. But uh, it's probably a little less, but it's half a mile. Close. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's, close. Yeah. In our in our semi country. 
yeah, country yes. blocks. So, so a half block away. Um, yeah. So he's he's back home and. So he just had a little like overnight vacation. Yeah. He he was great here. Laura was like, yeah, he'll probably end up here again. <laughs> no, it's gonna want to come hang now out. Now he knows that we give him good food. You know, we give him chicken and rice. Yeah. He'll probably well, we come had over. In the fridge and... that was appropriate. Yeah. So. Right. So anyway, so that was our one of our excitements. Good thing is he said that we use the same vet. So yes, I was I was just about ready to get set to go to the vet and check. And they them probably would have recognized. And they're like, them. oh, they would have recognized them, or at least you know, it was Australian Shepherd and probably made a call. Yeah, and would have made the connection, which was otherwise we just didn't know where we were gonna how we were gonna get a good connection. Um, yeah, unless somebody put up a sign or something. But it does make me. Well, Australian Shepherd, that one had really thick, long fur. So the only thing yeah. that would be, I mean, we had St. Bernard's, so they shed a lot too. But the only thing that would make me hesitate in getting an Australian Shepherd is that fur was really long. And I could see it get really tangled in our area. Yeah. So it have to be brushed all the time. So our St. Bernard that we had before was a smooth coat saint. So it had the shorter fur, although it was very thick. It almost looked almost like a small Bernice type fur. and yeah. Um, it was, it was, it was kind of like a, a Bernice, but longer, but with the bigger, and with the bigger smaller bones, bodies. it was, yeah, it wasn't too far off from a Bernice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it had the light, it had the white lightning strike on the head, like yeah. Boomer, like our St. Bernard. Yep. But so anyway, sweet dog, glad he made it home. Cause I think he would have been sad. Yeah, I had there. to go to the market on, on Thursday afternoon. I'm like, yeah. Oh, what well, are we this, dog do this dog seems pretty well, you know, in good shape, but. I'm going to have to leave it for like five hours. It was a hot day. It was yeah. humid as can be in 90 degrees, 90 some degrees. Like I can't leave it outside. We don't have a fenced in area right now. It's, yeah. it's been under construction and I'm like, I can leave it in the house, but it's going to be five or six hours. And I just don't know yeah. what's going to happen. So I was thankful that concerned. it got picked up and we, I wasn't yeah. trying to figure out how to take care of the dog and go to the market. Well, it wouldn't have been the full five or six hours. Cause I would have come home from work by the yeah, time you, true. yeah. But um, the other thing that happened on the 4th of July, being that we didn't do any fireworks or anything on the 4th, um, <laughs> you were tired. Um, well, we just ate dinner. And... That's true. But we hit, if you look in the upper right there, 1,000 subscribers, which is really cool, which is actually amazing. I never thought we would get that far, although I've had that goal so there for a while. Just barely a year. A year and a half, almost. Well, you put we your started, first, yeah. I started my first video in February or January. Yeah, January but that 15th. was just a... That was, January 15th. Yeah, but you didn't really start doing regular ones until just a little before we in started, June. We started, year, uh, June. we did a video a day almost through June, but I, w I had started a little bit before that and had some stuff. But, um, but yeah, we just hit 1,000 subscribers, so I do want to thank everybody for... Uh, subscribers, our new subscribers, old subscribers to uh, help us out with that, which also means that we're going to do a giveaway video, um, which we have to do. And I know you're crazy busy over the next few days. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking by the end of this week, I'll get it filmed and maybe early next week, hopefully get it up. Um, but we will have another giveaway. Um, so be on the lookout for that. We'll probably do something similar as we did for our 500 subscriber, um, we'll probably give some pasta away. I have a book I think is helpful that I might also, so we might have two winners. We'll have to see about that. Um, and think of some requirements, probably like sharing favorite video and commenting on the, the giveaway video and stuff. But, um, so thank you everybody for helping us reach that goal. I saw that go over on, on July 4th, I was actually, it was funny because my dad looked at it and he goes, you're at 998 subscribers. He goes, I got to get your mom subscribed. Um, so I was like, okay, well, she got a new fun phone. So I was like, you're going to have to figure it out because I subscribed to my dad for me. He was my second subscriber because actually Dan from Grassbed Homestead was our first subscriber because he was helping us out at the beginning a little bit. But, um, uh, so my dad was the second subscriber, but I had to do it for him. So I was like, dad, can you figure it out? Keep in mind, he just turned 80, right? Um, but, uh, he is, he figured it out. And so my mom was the 999th subscriber. And then I think all of a sudden, like 
I got another dozen people that day, and we're actually up to, I want to say, let's look here. What am I on right now? Oh, I can't see on this page. Darn it. I think last I looked, it was 1,012. So it's still going up, which is good, because sometimes it bounces back and forth a little bit. Because um, I think my theory is if someone has been subscribed to you for a long period of time and doesn't actually watch your videos, I have a feeling YouTube drops that subscription. I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling they do because you see these bounces back and forth a little bit as you go. So, but we will be doing that giveaway. So anyone interested and if gluten-free, I'll have one gluten-free option as a book, um, a gardening book that I use each year on, um, I think it's going to be the, uh, it's a journal basically, and you figure out what your average day last frost is and then fill in the dates uh, in this journal and it suggests <laughs> which, um, what things to plant when, what to start when, which is very helpful. And I've been using that as kind of a general guide. It has some tips and stuff in there as well. Um, but, and his allergies are going nuts still. But anyway, so that happened. We'll have to make a video for that. Um, we did have a couple videos come out this week. So, of course, we were just talking about my dad just turned 80. And we talked about this last week. It took me about a week and a half to get this video up. But I do give you a little bird's eye view of our plane ride. Um, no, actually, uh, plane view from the, for the ride. Uh, so for my dad's birthday, we went up in a biplane, which he was completely surprised by because um, we told him we were going to go to the Air Zoo Plane Museum, but which we did, but we didn't actually go in the museum. So he, at the parking lot figured out what we were doing, that we we're actually going to go up in a plane instead of go into the museum. Um, the other video we did has to do with our Forge Friday, or Fri what I call it? Forge Food Friday, um, and that is the Making Nochino video that we talked about a little bit last week, um, which is the uh, mm -hmm. black walnut liqueur. So we have both of those up. And we'll get into that. You had a question? You sound like you're about to talk. Nope. Um, <laughs> so we have those two videos going this week. Check those out if you haven't looked at them yet. Um, the other thing, if you've looked, actually, to remind you in the description down below is a link to our webpage, which has um, the, uh, the forging weekly forging uh, updates and things and this week we did the uh, the black walnut forge uh, which has a whole description in there on basically and you can follow along a little bit too but it's really if you want to know black walnuts obviously a lot of people know about walnuts and eating them and putting them in salads or on toppings and ice cream and candied walnuts and everybody like says that. the english walnut is far superior to the domestic black walnut but in our area, actually, a lot of us think the black walnut is much more tasty. It's yeah. just harder to harvest as a whole piece commercially. Yes. So it has a reputation that it's not as good eating. I personally think... I like it better. If you, I like the English walnut, but if you're doing, you know, like in ice cream or you're doing different things, that if you want the walnut flavor, you might as well use the black walnut when you it. Has it has a stronger, a little bit stronger flavor to it, it than is. the English walnut does. Um for those of you guys who don't know your trees, I do have a description of the tree and where it grows. Um, it tends to grow <coughs> mainly, uh, naturally it grows east of the Rockies. So it is technically a variety of east areas um, from as far south as like Georgia through up to Vermont and Ontario and Michigan all the way west to like... It grows great here. Yeah, it grows great naturally here. We found out there's some pecans here, just barely south of us. There's some people that have some cold weather pecans. Oh, yeah, farming pecans. They're a little smaller than the yeah. South pecans. That surprised me. Yep, but uh, yeah, there's some Amish growing them too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this black walnut. We only have one black walnut tree on our property, and it's right on the edge of the woods. It's medium size, but it's it's yielding. This year's gonna have a ton of nuts. Yeah, it is. It's got a lot. Last of nuts. year we had rough weather, not so many. 
So well, we still had a bunch. But those of you guys who don't know your trees, it does have a really grooved bark, like usually grayish to dark. I think I've seen some that are black, um, black bark or almost black. Um, the leaves are compound compound leaves that are arranged with the leaflets opposite and you can see the picture let's see if I pulled it up here um, yeah here we go so the little leaflets are arranged opposite here so a lot of times it is one last one on the end of the plant but not in all of the uh, um, leaflet or in of the uh, leaves it has that one on the end um, although mine does, I've bred some, some trees just don't have, don't seem to have that at all. Well, you, they get those new growth shoots that when it gets really dry in the summer and hot, sometimes it loses the whole, it's that off whole the leaf. whole yeah. section, almost a foot long. So, you know, yeah. That eight, whole eight leaf, to a foot. that whole leaf, technically this whole thing with all those little leaflets off the side is one leaf. Yeah. So sometimes it'll lose a leaf like that. And it is quite big. It could be, you know, almost a foot long, a foot long or I think sometimes more. Um, and then, yeah. uh, see, our cat's joining us. Um, the nuts, the, the flowers, I didn't get a picture of. They're actually kind of a long, narrow, uh, kind of stalk to it with multiple flowers off the side. Uh, they do make a little bit of a mess in the spring when they fall, but the nuts grow in little patches of twos or threes, which I can show you here up in the tree. Uh, they do sometimes fall off early. We have a bunch of green immature walnuts dropping right now uh, on our windy days, but they will grow up to uh, about up to sometimes up to three inches in diameter, but I would say yeah, closer to one are and a half. A little smaller than a one and a half, ball. two. Yeah. Almost a tennis ball size. Yeah. Yeah. Or probably a little, yeah, a little definitely smaller. smaller than that. Um, so most people do harvest them when they're ripe in the fall and dropping, um, from the tree. Sometimes you can, uh, the, some of the cult cultivated types will actually mature in the summer instead of in the fall. But, um, uh, basically they are, uh, let me get back to our regular picture here, webcam. So basically, uh, you a lot of people have different ways of getting into it because it's very hard to get into the walnut to get to the nut. The husks are a little tough. They turn your fingers purple or yellow or Eventually whatnot. Eventually black. <laughs> Eventually black if you peel enough of the husks off. The husks do get a little softer in the fall, so you can almost you can peel them off, but then you have the hard shell inside. I know people who will drive over them back and forth to crack the, the shells. Some people will use a vice, some people will use a hammer, some people stomp on them. Uh, I think I would get sore if I was stomping on walnuts the entire time. And if the ground's off, that won't work very well. But uh, it does take a bit of work to get into them, but they do have a flavorful nut on the inside. Uh, and of course, you can use the nuts in a lot of different ways. You use any nuts, including in baking and stuff. Uh, you can boil them for the oil, too which I've never done. Uh, you, can... you can bottle a lot of walnut oil for finishing salads. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's expensive. You just use a little bit at the end. Yeah. But... And then you can make some nut butter by crushing them um, and mixing it in with butter. And you can also harvest them green, which was interesting because all the books I had on eating walnuts was were talking about just getting them in the fall and harvesting them, you know, and uh, at that point for the nuts, of course, but none of them talked about harvesting them when they were green still. So we did that just recently. We harvested about, what did we get, about 30 or so or 50? Yeah, we were around 30. I went and grabbed a few off the lower branches with a pole pruner. Yeah, I grabbed what I could from with uh, a ladder. A batch of <coughs> Nochino only needs... 14 to 24, 25 um, walnuts, in nuts there. per, say, about liter, you know, quarter liter of uh, alcohol for to make the tincture. Yeah. So you don't need a lot. It's not like you're just packing it full. So we made two varieties last week. Um, so we, we, did we, a had video. About, we had about 30, and that's all we needed. Yeah, we did a video on one of the varieties. We did it more traditional, the more traditional one. We, we just did, did a, a plain a white liquor. We had some 
vodka in here. Vodka that we used. Yeah. <clears throat> and we in infused that. We also tried, I just had a wild idea, there's a inexpensive Irish whiskey called Patty's, which yeah. happens to be a little bit mellow and a little sweet and caramely, just slightly compared to some of the others. Um, and it's sort of the working man's uh, Irish whiskey. And I have a, a friend who really enjoys that. So I happen to have a bottle unopened sitting here because we're anticipating them coming over to our house at some point, yeah. um, which hasn't happened. So I had this great idea that it's already got these nice, lightly caramely, barely sweet flavors. I bet the darker walnut flavors would make a really nice um, digestive. Yeah. Um, so we took another, you know, we took the second half because I did. Oh, to start out with a didn't have enough vodka to do oh, okay. um, to do of all them. of them. I could only do half of it with the volume we had. So I dumped this bottle of patties over the top of them, and I just put a couple of cloves in. I didn't do any of the citrus or vanilla or anything you else. You put cinnamon in that one? I did put a cinnamon yeah. stick. Um, so you could you could do this with different types of <clears> But I didn't want to cover up. I, yeah, people yeah. put in different. Typically, they use a vodka or a rum or a, you know something, something like that. You could do a brandy or a white. Something a Typically a white neutral. liquor because you want to. Yeah. Uh, harness the flavor and then they do a whole bunch of yeah. aromatizing spices frequently like mulling type yeah. items but with this second batch I wanted to be able to taste the two things pretty plain a couple cloves and cinnamon so I just dumped that bottle of uh, Irish whiskey over it and uh, we'll know in six months to a year if it was uh, How good it is. Yeah. worth the effort and uh, I yeah. guess the expense of, of it um, yeah <clears throat> but uh so it was a fun experiment. Um, it is traditional uh, to make that black walnut liqueur kind of in Central Europe and into Italy. So the Italian North, Northern it, Italy, Florence yeah. on up. Yep. Yeah. Nocino is what they call it in Italy. And I think I said it right in the video. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy it. I mean, you would have to go to your specialty yeah. store that has a lot of stuff. But it's... Or a Horvit. Or a Horvit. Or something like that is the Croatian one, okay. word for yeah. it. And I've seen... <laughs> bottles <clears throat> online with that written on it um, yeah so it's not particularly expensive it's just a little harder to find but if you go to your right niche specialty store yeah and you want to try it um it's probably slightly tincture medicinal um it's kind of a digestive for calm you know calm your stomach or after a big meal yeah. type of thing you're not going to drink a lot of it it would be kind of a specialty thing it's a holiday item sometimes, in fact so. in fact the only um books i have that listed the what we made were the medicinal books because it's used mm -hmm. as a digestive after meal um as a tincture treat upset stomach sometimes in the flu or food poisoning i figure if you got an upset stomach it makes you throw up so it treats <laughs> i don't know that's my don't guess know. is what the I treatment think it is. has well also i mean if you think alcohol kills bacteria so it is it the yeah. alcohol that's killing it or is it the walnut or that's the killing it? Or, or i don't know or the herbs that you have. But people know that, you know, soda and bitters, yeah. uh, which really has almost no alcohol, very little bit, if you, but they're aromatized, that soda and bitters is very good for calming stomachs Stomach. or for In digestion. Fact, there are some people who are saying that this liqueur almost tasted a little bit like a cola. So we'll see when in six months when we get to try it. But I did uh, take a little break here. I was looking at our webpage for my notes, but um, to come back to it, I just wanted to say hi to Green yep. Gables and Yankee Living and Born Again Farm Girl and welcome and Christy. Christy I'm not yep. sure if I said hi to Christy. I think I might have. Um, yeah, it's amazing the squirrels can get to them. They have no problem. They bury them all over the yard and they definitely get to them. They, yeah, and eat them up. But uh, we so like a pecan tree. I love the black walnuts, but I would love a pecan tree. Yeah. But we we would really be pushing it with our soil and with our climate. Yeah, we're a little. A, um, probably just out of the range for the northern pecan. We're uh, 100 miles. If we we're 100 miles south, we would be in a lot yeah. better shape for doing a temperate pecan. Yeah. So we will have to have a tasting probably around the holidays. So be on the lookout for that six months down the road. Oh, and then one other medicinal use I did see, a traditional use for it, was actually externally using the tincture to treat uh, fungal infections. So like athlete's foot and ringworm and stuff like that was kind of interesting. Well, the alcohol and otherwise, but yeah, yeah, I just had an idea. So traditionally in Europe, most of the cakes, the, the genoise and, and things are very dry compared to American style. Uh -huh. So they're typically soaked with uh liqueurs right. and this this starts with the white liquor but then you finish it with simple syrup 
so it becomes moderately sweetened. I'm thinking it might actually make Hi, a Bear. very nice soak for a holiday um, layer cake or something, which I don't do a lot. I just don't usually have time to be. Yeah, yeah, but no. I could totally see doing a fairly dense like a fruit cake type cake. thing. Well, you could do that. You could definitely soak a fruit cake in it, I think. That, that has a lot of spices. So I'm not yeah. sure if you'd taste it, but I think making a almost like a um, a base for like a, almost like a Boston cream or a, you know a, okay. a heavier, denser base, and doing the soak with that might make a really nice. It'd be um, interesting to cake. Yeah, we might have to experiment with that come the holidays. So and have a, a straight tasting of it as well. So that was kind of fun. So we'll see how that turns up. We're always into experimenting with things. So um, we'll see what the bl black walnut liqueur tastes like. But uh, actually, what was the holiday that the Italians always make it on? Because they always associate they things. They tend with... to make it during the feast of Saint Paul. I think it is June twenty fourth. I think it was Saint Paul yeah. or Saint Peter. One of the two. One of the big um, saints. Yeah. <laughs> um, because they always seem to associate certain harvests with certain saint days and stuff or other holidays and things. So that was one that tends well, to Well, it's actually day. something, going back as a chef, we tend to have everything available all the time. We make things that are semi-connected. I see that. a new On a new farm in Illinois. That sounds That's fun. So sounds cool. like a ton of work. Yeah. But that is fun to get started and see what's growing. Yeah. Naturally. Cool. Anyway. So, I, I, so traditionally in Italy and France and around the world, you have feast days and you have pastries and desserts or, or different dishes that are made seasonally. And it helps people remember the seasons and to make them yeah. in certain times and whatever. And what to look at. We for. tend to make stuff all year long, like, uh, or we make things before a holiday, during the holiday and after the holiday. Yeah. Um, and so they're not as special. So if you go through the historical French and Italian books, especially, and I think Eastern European and other things, but even the, like you can find English too. There's certain yeah, certain you can holidays. find all these things, and it makes it a lot more fun when you only make it once a year, yeah, um, or for just for a week or something, so that it, it really becomes like, special. Something like this, where you actually set it up once a year, and then you have it ready for you know major holidays like Christmas and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. but it's a good way to keep it's a, you know it was a way to keep calendar as yeah. as. A peasant or somebody who didn't have a lot of resources or education or calendars or watches and thing. I mean, yeah. calendar, people had calendars of sorts, but uh, but it's a but good yeah. way to keep in step. For with, illiterate, you know, yeah. and you know you're out there in what's harvestable at different times of year. So these things get associated with the different holidays. Hi, yeah. Lady B. Um, so, yeah, you should check out the video on making the notino. By the way, I'm not sure that those of you who don't drink that's fine and those that yeah, this yeah. is more of a sipping um tincture flavor i don't think drinking a lot of it would be a great idea no i have a feeling you would not it, feel very well it, a heck of a headache off i mean of it. i'm just guessing what is an aperitif supposed to be it's supposed an to be an aperitif is, begins your meal and, and it, the digestive after the meal yeah so the aperitif is usually bitter and dry or herbaceous and it makes you salivate and prepare you to be hungry and wet your mouth to enjoy your meal. Your digestive sometimes is sweet. It tends to be powerful and strong because your mouth is now full of fats and flavors and your brain doesn't want a lot more food. So you need to, like a dessert, have something that's either desirable or something that's got a very strong flavor and cuts through all of it, or it's something that's gonna calm and allow you to settle the begin stomach. to settle the stomach and actually digest. And if you look at tradition, and I know there's a lot of people that move more into holistic eating, but traditionally people ate things in a pattern because it assisted in digestion. their eating and their digestion. Like we eat salads first yeah. in the United States typically, but in Italy and France and other things, you eat them towards the end because um, you don't want, they take a long time to digest and break down. So if you, block your digestion with you know if you have meats and cheeses and breads and all these other things but you got all this fibrous stuff it kind of holds it all in your stomach and you feel bloated if you eat it part way through your meal or towards the end now you have these bitter greens which make your gastric juices run and I break away. it starts to allow you to digest and settle these fattier foods and heavier yeah. foods so so this one you is can a pattern dig eat so this would be either digestive. a digestive or it could be a medicinal tincture 
or it could be used as a bitters, yeah. uh, which you might then, if you don't sugar it, or you could use it before a meal or to use it to flavor another drink and bring out a nuance of herbaceous and heavier flavors and something that's yeah. a little sweet and, and lighter. So yeah, there is a proper use for each of these. Yeah. Um, but it's usually used in a very small amount. So it's not, yeah, it would be it would be yeah. a part an ounce or two ounces. And you're not you know, going to go have glasses and glasses of this. No, because <laughs> it's it's too strong and it's yeah, you know, it's like doing an espresso shot. You don't need any more. You don't want any more. It doesn't taste good after a small amount. So anyway, have any of you guys? And there are other things you could do with black walnuts, by the way. Um, there's the I didn't put the recipe for the pickles in there. <laughs> there are the the green walnut pickles, pickles yes, um, which, which have mixed opinions on how good they are. Yeah, it's a pretty strong. So if you come from a Mediterranean background that eats a lot of vinegar um, and strong flavored items, you'll probably like it because it's a pretty sharp white vinegar pickling. Uh, so yeah, yeah, nice tall glass of limoncello. Yeah, there's three types of limoncello, by the way. <laughs> I, I spent a little bit of time in the Amalfi Coast, so yeah, uh, a lot of the limoncello is imported and really got popular and was kind of junky but the the properly made ones are pretty good they do extraction from the lemons like in a vodka so it's very strong and lemony and then they do it sweetened so it's a liqueur that you would have as a dessert or you would soak cakes or put it over fruit that sounds good yeah it, and that's yeah i prefer that because the other strong one is is just very strong um unless you're putting into like an icing or something um and then the third one is they do um, like a creamy one or a somewhat milk-based one. So, yeah. Well, um, use black walnuts for I've parasite heard about, control yeah, on livestock. Yeah, using them for yeah. parasite control, yes. Yes. Um, Not many animals like the walnut husk or the walnut, so pretty rough. But, uh, but yeah, no, they can – I did see some um, antimicrobial and mainly antifungal is kind of what – I didn't do the, the, the literature search. I just did – my uh, traditional, you know. Oh, uh, breakaway! You got the uh, walnut pickles and watermelon cake book. Is that got that? It's a very cool book. Like I, I hopefully, you know, like I said, it's a kind of difficult. It? It's sort of oh, there a, it is. Walnut a little, diffi a little difficult to get a hold of, and we and mentioned little, it last week. A little pricey uh, uh, when I was looking for and got one, but um, God, yeah, he looked a, all over for this thing. It took me a little harder than most books, and I got a lot of cookbooks. Yeah. But so it's that's, a great historical book for Midwest and really yeah. coming out of Michigan. Yeah, it's specifically a century of Michigan cooking. So that is yeah. kind of cool to have. I hope that was the cookbook you are talking about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been another one. That's the one we mentioned last week. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that one's it's actually kind of hard to find. Oh, I think it's one of the – I got it about three years ago. And, you know, there's kind of one or two cookbooks every year that stand out that are very sort of groundbreaking or I find really interesting. And that was one of my top two or three yeah. for a year of, wow, this is really great. Uh, not that the recipes were necessarily great, but the historical relevance and how yeah. they're used and it's the climate and foods of our area. So, yeah. Um, grain alcohol, leave the vodka to the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> well, grain alcohol, yeah, pure grain yeah. alcohol works great too. Yeah, uh, Most of these tinctures, you want a high proof white alcohol to get a proper... Um, Extraction. By the way, some extractions and tinctures they do the double extraction, so you have a portion of water, although there is some water, yeah. and um, so you need the water and the alcohol to pull out certain and there are some uh, flavors and chemicals. There are some recipes in Notino that actually had water in, included in that. Yeah, I think it's better to cut them to extract at high alcohol and then cut it later um, to usable strength later. I think you get a better extraction. So. And we did. We have done experiments with um, some other extractions uh when did we do that that was last Late fall oh well it was yeah november maybe it was, yeah, it was just before right the snows before the holidays oh, yeah uh we did primarily a sassafras tincture now this was a pseudo medicinal potential you know. and playing with yeah we were playing around with things that we knew were safe you too. put sassafras you put we're going to try this because we haven't had it in a while and it's been sitting for. I should probably, I never strained it also. A lot of tinctures, you never strain them. Yeah. Um, so it's been sitting with all the stuff in it. But you had uh, the sassafras root, the. You had. Sassafras um, root. I had a little bit of cinnamon. I had uh, rose hips. Um, did you put juniper in there? 
I had fresh juniper berries that we had collected. This was all harvested. I, had, I did have a little bit of angelica root, which was not from us. And um, I'm trying to think of the name of that one. We put some um, Solomon seal, yes. a couple really nice Solomon seal. Roots. Um, I put in a few other herbs. I should take a picture of our Solomon seal. They're nice and big right now. Yeah, we have really large Solomon seal, which yeah. uh, not be roasts. She dries them and then roasts them the in root. tin foil, the root, and yeah. then eats them. They're kind of hard, but they're actually a little sweet. Yeah. You use the same recipe with orange peels. Yep. Yep. I love orange peel. Uh, very, it really brings out nice flavors. Uh, use orange and lemon slightly differently. Um, so, yeah. So, this, this is what we made last year. And there was probably about 20 items in there. Um, and he didn't write it down. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think I did. Did somewhere. you? Where? Um, oh, I have some big chunks of ginger in here also. So there's ginger and sassafras. We're thinking root beer flavors. A uh, cup, one bay leaf. Uh, a couple whole nut. No, black cardamom. I think I have whole black cardamom or nutmeg. <laughs> Hard to tell looking in. It's probably whole nutmeg because I don't think I have black cardamom right now. Um. Do you have cinnamon sticks in there too? There's one or two. Uh, there's a tea bag. I think it's a bergamot tea, couple of bergamot tea bags. Oh, right, yeah. So we were playing around with that. So this was done with white rum. No. You had one rose. The first one was done. This was done with. He has two of them here. White rum. This was the bottle. Yeah. Um. And strained out after, let's say, uh. Um, about a month or so. By the way, it was very potent. I think we may have overdone our the amount of stuff. So that was <laughs> might have to cut. We it. had tried it a little bit, and that's why we were like, "All right, we got to strain this because this is going to taste terrible." Um, it's going to make Jaeger, it's going to make Jägermeister and things like that taste good. So um, I strained that out and set it aside, and mm -hmm. then we refilled it with spiced rum, Costco spiced rum. Yeah. Um, because so that already had some herbing and spicing and some darker flavors and we've left that so let's say from november till now roughly so jason abe books abe i use abe books a lot uh, i love abe books because okay. less people know about them and they have a lot of historical use stuff and a lot of it's dirt cheap like five dollar cookbooks that people paid fifty dollars for um a few like 10 years ago yeah abe books is a i don't even tell a lot of people about abe books because I, they've got thousands of books, but they're one of my best resources when I'm having a hard time finding a used book. Okay. Well, and, and they're a secondary, they're a seller, so um, they will source from all over the country or sometimes I think around the world. But his, and they do a ton of cookbooks. Yeah. So should we try this? Do we need to cut this? I would try a small amount because I'm not excited to try a large amount. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> And this is, you know, it's I like sass. Like it should be sort of root berry. Seven might, or eight months. Might be able to put it over. Yeah, it's been sitting on a back shelf in the basement. Just, uh, yeah, and might be able to cut it with soda or something and, and actually make a really nice root berry thing. It smells like medicine. It does smell like medicine. <laughs> it doesn't smell like Jägermeister, but it smells something kind of in that range. Kind of tastes like medicine. Yeah, it's fairly medicinal. Wow. It's a little, got a little skunky funky from something in it. it definitely tastes sassafras. I would clearly put this in the medicine category. It tastes like cough syrup. It does. <laughs> yeah. It's strong. I would put it very um, digestive. It actually tastes a lot like bitters. It tastes. So Angostura is probably the most common used right now, yeah. but Pichot um, is the most traditional classic one. I started doing some barbecue sauces with some Pichot in it. Um, it's fairly strong flavor. It's not. It doesn't taste that different from Angostura. Bitters. It's not. It's not that bad. It's medicinal, definitely. I wouldn't drink a glass of it. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> but for a tiny amount, I think you could bad. put it into a cocktail or put it into you a might, so yeah. do a soda water and. A spritz like you use bitters. Yeah. Of course, I don't know what we're going to do with a gallon of bitters. I guess yeah, we have a lot of it. I guess it doesn't go bad. All right. So, anyway, there was that. Wow. <laughs>
<laughs> we did not do a video making that one because you were playing with it. We, we were just playing around. I think, think we, we got, talked about it on a previous live show in the in we the winter. Did it, yeah, we did late. Yeah, late but or, uh, or quick or something. But maybe we'll have to look up some root beer recipes though, and do some like do a. I think some of my roots were a little on the large side, even. Yeah, but yeah, I think we'll have to put sass. Um, yeah, sassafras. We on have our an list. unlimited supply of sassafras on our property. We do. That's part of the reason we went, and we <laughs> like the root beer flavor. So. So and actually, any other requests? We should probably do sassafras. We should probably do Solomon Seal, um, for uh some of these forged things. Um. And this forged. this also came from not only with the sassafras, but Nobby does some tinctures of an extract because it is the best a way reishi to reishi. We got to do to do oh we have a bunch of reishi yeah we doing have a bunch extractions of reishi. and medicinally even pharmaceutically they do a lot of extractions using alcohol and water and other things new yeah it's a new Swedish bitters exactly <laughs> um, and they're really um, the Swedes and you know and Scandinavians are really the masters of herbal yeah. herbal tinctures the Dutch became famous from founding they're gin. Not they're, they're I, not I Scandinavian. I know that, but they became sort of the famous ones with gin. But yeah, yeah. the Scandinavians have vast varieties and are probably much better at it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we did the well, the Dutch and the Geneva. So Nabi was like, "Oh, do a tincture, do a tincture, medicinal tincture." So we we're kind of thinking along those lines. Yeah. When I worked with a lot of Jamaicans, um. They would carry, and, and when we were in Trinidad, they would carry around snake bite juice. Yeah. Uh, so if you've ever been to the Caribbean or done any hiking, don't know if it oh works. Um, Those were scary mixtures. Oh, I didn't. I never tried any. They put like any poisonous, like in Trinidad, they put anything poisonous. They put like a scorpion tail. They'd put like poisonous spiders in mm -hmm. this tincture, and they put semi poisonous oh, plants, um, very small amounts. And take of, like. A drop or two at a time to try to get themselves immune yeah, to the Yeah, effect. you take a drop like once a week or once a month or sometimes once a day. Warm one. And they would and they would take a very small amount. Uh, and the idea was, yeah, to it wasn't some people go, Oh, it's supposed to cure your snake bite. No. The idea was to have enough resistance or that your body would recognize it and fight it enough that you could go get medical help and that you wouldn't die in the process yeah. of a of you know, scorpion, snakes, whatever. I I mean it's very much people carry it around with them. It's sort of a personal thing, and it's uh yeah. People don't usually offer it to other people. They have their own little mixture. It's, and it was the bush. And I had yeah the bush really old bush medicine. Yeah. I had no interest in trying it, but it wasn't offered any. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was so, don't no. want snakes and spiders. And we like, saw some of them, but yeah, yeah, we definitely it's and I with a lot of Jamaicans that I work with, a yeah. lot of them do it. So. Yeah. So that was uh, definitely an interesting experience. Wormwood. There. So wormwood is used in absinthe. Um, and there's European and American wormwood. A whole bunch of different wormwoods. Uh, wormwood ways of putting into tinctures and absinthe. And for a while it was illegal in the U.S. And then they said that it, you know, it causes people to go crazy or eventually it kills them. And that the writers did a lot of absinthe. Interesting, the research, and it's now, it's been available in the U.S. for quite a while, yeah. the last 10 years or plus, 15 years. Um, the chemical in wormwood, they thought it would cause these hallucinogenics or, um, you know, or death uh, eventually. But there is no research to support that from what I understand. I'll have and to, look it up. to prove that point, sage, has some of the sa same sage is very, you know, is very strong. Um, and we don't use a lot of sage. Some people don't even like it. It has the same active chemical as wormwood, but it has some massive amount, and so, and that's not regulated at all. So it used yeah. to be that so they'd have some regulations on on how much wormwood, or you'd add the wormwood into the into the absinthe, and so they in France regulated a certain parts per million. Well, there is no regulation on sage. So if you're really interested in it, you can put a whole ton of sage, in and you'll have the same thing. Yeah. So the research doesn't. It seems to be a lot of a lot of hooey on that. I one. mean, yeah, it probably. I what else were they doing? I had a doing? friend, a Russian friend, who loved absinthe. And what else were they doing? Is the question. Well, the long we're doing the opium dens and yes. other things at the same time. So, so yeah, I tried. So I had a friend, a Russian friend, who loved absinthe, and I tried all these different ones. I tried some once with him. At a, it was a French brasserie that has the little absinthe pouring things and huh. whole deal. It's not very good. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't care for it. I think so. Yeah. 
Yes, and tons of licorice. Oh, Scandinavia, Netherlands, even into Italy, all kinds of licorice flavors. The Dutch flavors. licorice, I'm not a fan of. Strong. Yeah, the Italians salty, love it, too. Salty Dutch licorice. Oh, the Greek, everybody has yeah. their... You know, their Uzo and their Zambuca well, and, and, and all the rest of them. Licorice flavor. You have your uh, Sweet Sicily. That root. is medicinal without question. Sweet Sicily? No, the Licor well, licorice. licorice. They both are. Yeah. Licorice root. Um, Asian. Uh, lots of Asian, Indian, Chinese yeah. use of licorice. That's why you like so much Italian sausage. I say, well, and you can put a lot of uh, fennel seed, which has licorice. Yeah. Yeah, I like I make my own Italian sausage. We like Italian sausage. I like Italian sausage. I don't usually like like anise or licorice flavors, but I love Italian sausage. So if it's cooked in something, has, yeah, the finocchio. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so <laughs> that was so. I think we went through everything on my list. So that's yeah, good. we didn't really. I mean, we kind of segued through tinctures, which is yeah. a a actual true educated discussion of tinctures. Yeah. <laughs> So um, it'll be interesting to try to play with some others, too, if we want to. Um, we're always experimenting with our gardens, our food forest, our, you know, everything. I would say there. I would bring the tincture to the hoot nanny so we could actually we use some. But that. we can't because it's a method <laughs> campground. Yes. It would be a good way to get rid of some of it. Everybody go, wow, this is terrible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, a, my gosh. Nope. Not on. It's not medicine. That, no. Not no, we will not bring it to the hoot nanny. <laughs> um, yeah. The Methodists are, are fairly dry. Uh, they don't drink alcohol at all. Um, What's or at the least tincture? That, no, my what grandfather it? didn't. Um, my grandfather was a Methodist minister. And he didn't care if we did. He was actually a... Um, uh, he was in a dry county, actually, it, where Asbury Seminary was, because he used to teach at Asbury Seminary and one of the top uh, seminarians and biblical archaeologists and ministers in the area. But um, but in a dry county, but he was a lot more open to, we he, we would have like drinks in the kitchen while my grandparents were in the living room, and they actually didn't mind us having drinks at our I wedding. Never, I never did. <laughs> no, your, your cousins did. No, I, cause, yeah, I was at I was at your grandparents' house two or three times. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. They would you know the cousins would hang out in the kitchen, and the grandparents would hang out in the living room, and you know whatever. But, um, but yeah, the Methodists are pretty darn dry, um, in general, if they're following what they're doing. Is there a no. <laughs> just one is, ask your uncle if he knows of, uh, Dr. Livingston, <laughs> not the one in Africa, uh, <laughs> G. Herbert Livingston, because if you went to, uh, a, if you went to seminary at Asbury, I think that's the main Methodist the seminary. Ones, yeah. He probably knows my grandfather. So my grandfather's been passed for, um, I guess, eight years or so now. Mm -hmm. Something like that. But uh, they they definitely have a lot of memorials and stuff around uh, Wilmer, Kentucky for him. But uh, I think my allergies are going away. Maybe the tincture works. <laughs> or just cleared your sinuses a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I'm taking more allergy meds. I think that's... go take some cinnamon tea. That'll clear your sinuses a little bit too. I know. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I got to go downstairs and finish. Working. And it's caffeinated. Oh, um, it's even worse. I got to get up early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. yeah Any other you... questions or topics or? Yeah. Yeah. So I know this is running. Italian sausage. Yes. Any other? What's your favorite type of sausage? That's a good one. That's we're kind of in the summer sausage and grilling, Fourth of July, and there's so many varieties across pig. the country. We need another pig, but I need time to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we we're we're down. basically we got a pound of sausage and two pork chops left, and our pig is done. Yeah. Which yeah means I'll have to buy that. pork from Norm. Yeah, I'm not as connected into the Methodist community, but you know, most Methodist ministers, if they were trained, in he was Methodist, fairly famous because he was very involved in a lot of research and worked and, and starting and schools. Instructor, yeah, he was very yeah. well known. So. Yeah, um, and wrote a lot of books. Um, yeah, he did wrote, a lot of he wrote a lot. Yeah. He wrote a lot. He did a lot of translations, the Bible translations um, from. He would, his primary focus was on the Old Testament. He would do, uh, like, Aramaic to English translations and stuff. 
then your grandmother would translate it from Herbert Livingston to English. To uh, she would take his yeah handwriting and she would type everything up for him. So my Make grandmother was my grandmother was actually highly involved in everything he was doing, and I'm not sure. I mean that era they didn't um always like put them in the author list or anything or editor list or anything. No, but my I grandmother guess, was, yeah she was pretty involved. She was his too. typist basically, <laughs> um because he was never an extremely good typist, but she was. Very well. He, she actually typed his dissertation as well. So, yeah. But they were fun. They were always working together on things. So, But he had been to Israel a few times to, on archaeological digs. He uh, was very involved in the education side of things. And he uh, was very involved in, in um, translations from Hebrew or Aramaic into English. He was actually even known... Because he he did a lot of small town uh, uh, churches for a while and would go out and have like a number of churches where he would be in, you know go out and preach at, and he was at one point living in New York on the Pennsylvania border, a little ways from New York City. This is kind of like the area where a lot of the Jewish go holiday now. Mm -hmm. It's a good hour, hour and a half out. Yeah, yeah. um, and they have. A lot, a lot of, of camps, a yeah. lot of camps and mm -hmm. things that area. And I guess there was one Jewish boy in town and this was when my dad was probably 10 years old. So gosh, that's 70 years ago, one Jewish boy in town and the boy was about to turn 13, which they do their bar mitzvahs at 13, but they didn't have a rabbi in town. The closest rabbi was in New York city. So he couldn't go there all the time. I was longer than an hour and a half away away at that point a significant yeah no highways and activity yeah. yeah so but he had worked with this rabbi on some translations in the old testament um from the hebrew and he'd worked closely with them my grandfather did so the rabbi contacted my grandfather to teach this jewish boy the hebrew and the pronunciations of the hebrew so that um he would know the pronunciations and then of course they have to chant for their um uh, for the bar mitzvah, they have to go through the whole chant. So he was going to learn the Hebrew from my grandfather, and then he would go back to New York to learn the cadence of the chant that he was supposed to do because it follows a certain, you know, structure to it. So he would go to learn that from the rabbi, but he actually learned Hebrew from my grandfather, which was kind of interesting. So <laughs> he was an interesting man, just to put it that way. He had a lot to do with a lot of different cultures. Um, not just the Methodists, <laughs> so he had a connection to a lot of people. But uh, anyway, it's after 10 o'clock at night, so unless anybody has any questions about anything else, um, we can, I'm just scrolling back to see if we missed anything. Um, I think we got covered everything, unless anyone has any other questions about anything else we're talking about. Bree got stuck on the phone. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, you can catch the playback later. I always send comments. Yeah. Uh, send comments later. Uh, again, be on the lookout for our celebration video of our 1,000 subscribers. Yeah. So is that going to be make a video or is that going to be? No, a, we're going to make a video. And they're going to. What we'll probably do is something similar. Make a video. We'll post it with the requirements of what you do. We'll have a couple prizes. It'll probably be something like what we did last time, um, which basically was go share one of our videos. We mm -hmm. have over 200 videos at this point, too, so you have a lot to choose from. But if you go share one of your favorite videos and then post in the comments on that video, our, our 1,000 subscriber video celebration giveaway thing, that uh, which video you shared, have to be subscribed mm -hmm. to us, you know, a couple requirements like that. Um, and then we'll do a drawing, um, probably pick two people, uh, give away pasta and give away this book. Or if there's a preference to not do pasta, we can always do the book and have a choice between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and we'll probably just order that book straight from Amazon and mail it out from Amazon so that shipping is easier. Um, yeah, no reason to pay for shipping twice. No, <laughs> not at all. 
But anyway, so I'm thinking we'll we'll put something like that together this week and be on the lookout for that at the end of this week or early next week. And I do have a garden update video and I have a lot of other things to update from the or to edit from the farm stuff that we've been doing. So um, lots coming. Be on the lookout and we will definitely be back next week with another forage food and it'll probably be a little more well, this is more food related to. Don't be mean to your neighbors this week and give them zucchinis. <laughs> zucchinis a, official zucchini up. explosion has begun. They're no longer <laughs> appropriate gifts. <laughs> no. And in this area, our zucchini plants are going yeah. nuts. In fact, actually, oh gosh, that's a whole other story. I meant to plant, I had a package of uh, crookneck squash and a package of seeds and a package of zucchini seeds. But somehow I have two different varieties of zucchini grown. We have so the light, softer one, and then we have the traditional green darker one. Darker one, yep. yeah. So, well, Carol loves that light one. Really loves it. It's something special for them. Okay. They do different things with it, and she got all excited. The olive oil, Carol. Yes. Yeah. We have a partnership from our pasta business with a olive oil importer. Olive oil importer, and she imports it from her family's. Uh, grove in Lebanon, which is kind of cool too. So that's a whole mm -hmm. other story. Very tasty stuff. It is. It's really good. Finishing oil, not a cooking oil. Yeah. But drops, uh, use some drops. It's expensive. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's very good. But it's very good. It's worth it. It's a good value. It's just not cheap. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for joining us tonight, and thank you, Finite World, for moderating and mm -hmm. getting all those links up for us. And we will be. Same time, same place next week, 9 o'clock Eastern mm -hmm. Standard Time. So we'll say good night for now and see you next time. Good night.